This is the Todd Shapiro Show on Canada Talks, Sirius XM 167. I met a great dude at dinner the other night, and I'm like, I'm always fascinated by entrepreneurs and the entrepreneurial spirit and, and stories behind what makes them such successful entrepreneurs, but also, you know, the, the path that, that sort of led them down that road and uh, someone sort of involved in the uh, cannabis space at Halo Labs, uh, the CEO of the company. We're having dinner, and I'm just like, this guy's, like, this guy's awesome. He's knowledgeable. He's smart. He's real. He's genuine. And we got to talking. He just had a, a neat sort of history. And I, and I just said, Let, let's put him on air. And, you know, I, as we say in radio, save it. So I don't want to. I don't want to know anymore. Save it. This is a compelling uh, conversation we're about to have. Uh, please welcome. I'm not quite sure where he is. He's he's always uh, jet setting across this great globe of ours. Uh, Karen Sadu. Hey, Karen. Hi. Thanks for having me. Of course. Where whereabouts uh, are you now? I'm in. I'm in. Uh, I'm in the Palm Springs area of California in Cathedral City, um, and we make uh, we manufacture what's known as distillate here. Um, where we take uh, the marijuana and put it through a series of processes and out comes beautiful um, distil- distilled oil. Um, here it's THC, and it's typically between 85 and 95 percent pure. Uh, and interesting, I mean, this is, I mean, is the short form of that extraction? Yeah, it is. I mean, extraction is sort of a, a broad term for it because you can extract, um, you know, you can extract many different things. And so distill, distill, distillation is, let's call it a subset of extraction, because, you know, I can extract beautiful frozen flour and then out will come live resin after I uh, put it in a, in a fancy oven called a vacuum desiccanter. Um, or I can take uh, dried, uh, you know, trimmings and I put it through uh, a, an extraction column and then through a whole bunch of different processes and then out comes distillate which goes into the vape pens i mean it's a you know there's a whole uh you know there's a whole you know there's a whole variety of uh products that can be extracted so, in terms of like when you're extracting uh, i mean what kind of quantities are we talking about here with halo canna oh here in uh here in uh and it's like a suspension of disbelief i had a, a <laughs> very large uh dispensary chain in uh this uh um you know this this morning um actually it was um uh, actually it was the uh, company called the harborside it's a it's a it's a really famous uh dispensary chain uh, out of oakland and he came in here and our our facility here is two thousand square feet and when he looked at it he asked he said you know how much do you how much do you extract out of this facility and i said you know we can do up to twelve thousand pounds of material a month um, and it, you know, it pretty much, he pretty much shook his head and said, wow, you know, that's, that's pretty amazing. Well, Karen, when you put these sort of GMP facilities together and stuff, I think what, what's sort of not talked about enough in, in, in the cannabis industry as a whole is, is sort of the regulations, the compliance, the testing, uh, that goes along with that. And, you know, how, how does that oh. start from an idea to a concept to now, Hey, this is how we've made it happen with 12,000 pounds a month. And by the way, this is how clean and compliant it is all right so the first thing is you know what i always tell people is that the cannabis you smoke is cleaner than the organic um you know the organic fruit you eat Hmm. because um here in california where i'm at it's parts per billion so testing you know they we test for everything from you know fungus bacteria foreign material um you know, pages and pages of pesticides. And if one thing fails, then the whole lot has to be destroyed. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really, really a high standard, you know. And now um, there's all this talk about uh, cutting agents, right? And now you're hearing about people having, you know, dying from vaping and using cutting agents. And I'll tell you one thing. We have produced and sold over 4.5 million grams of cannabis oils and concentrates and we have never, ever, ever even contemplated putting anything other than it than the natural cannabis product itself. You know, it's, uh, it's amazing to me. 
It is amazing. And, and what's amazing to me along the same lines here, Kieran, is that the black market exists so heavily still. And, and you know, and, and speaking more specifically in Canada, uh, where legalization has happened, edibles are coming to play soon on the 17th. And, and yet, you know, we hear reports and some say 50 percent, some say 70 percent of cannabis is still being bought uh, through this black gray market, whatever you want to call it. And, and yet there is no compliance. How do we know what's being uh, served up or sold that way? And is, is, it, is it this sort of strange dichotomy right now within this industry because of that? Um, yeah, there is definitely a strange dichotomy. And Health Canada, remember, in, in the United States, especially in, uh, you know, in California, Nevada, and Oregon, where we operate, it, and in Colorado, obviously, in Washington, it's a big source of tax revenue. In Oregon, it was the first sales tax the state ever imposed was on cannabis. So it's revenue that drives that. So the regulation and the products that have been released are more forward, right? In Canada, it's a health – remember, it's Health Canada. Ah. What they've been doing is they've been very slow and systematic in releasing products. So first it was flour. Then a year later we're going to do some edibles. Then we're going to get into the vaporization products. Then we're going to get into the concentrates. And, and that is because it's a health authority driving it as opposed to a revenue authority driving it. But I'll tell you that even in Canada, you know, you still have the seed to sale. You still have the strict third-party pesticide testing. So you know that when you go into a legal dispensary, what you're getting is clean. And, you know, I would definitely say that when you go, you know, to your uh, corner, uh, you know, drug dealer or you go to a <laughs> gray market dispensary – I could almost guarantee you that it's not going to be the same clean, safe product. But, yeah, you're going to get a deal, you know, because there are no taxes, what have you. But, you know, it's, it's definitely not clean stuff. I always I sort of laugh and I don't know if people in the cannabis industry like the the comparables, but I, I think to myself, like, what happened when prohibition ended for alcohol? Like, were there still guys making it out of bathtubs, trying to find alleyways and parks and selling it to you? Or like somehow that got regulated and pushed through. And um, and, and I'm just amazed that it's it's such a long pro. I, it really does amaze me, man, especially for the tax dollars, like you say, especially for the job creation, especially for a lot of these studies that have come out. And it's tough yet to make health claims on this kind of stuff but at least helping with opioid crisis and these kind of things that that this isn't just sort of pushed through a little quicker by by governments of all countries no i i i I couldn't agree with you more but you know change especially at that level takes time and you know i would probably believe that you know i haven't really studied prohibition i think it was like 1933 was the date um, but I'm sure it must have taken a good, you know, 10 years before the bathtub gin and the, you know, and all of that sort of, you know, eviscerated. Um, but, you know, I, I, I never studied it. But here there's, you know, definitely when we think about products and we think about pricing them, we do think about the black market. Right. So we we have to think, you know, that what price would this be selling in the black market and can we effectively compete with it? You know, it's, it's a very important calculus in a lot of the products we do, especially our everyday value brands. Right. That's very, very, um, you know, it's a very, very important calculation. there. Which I would imagine sort of would be a frustrating one, uh, you know, trying to compete with with people who can can clearly cut cut some of the corners and cut, which means cutting some of the costs. <laughs> it, it is frustrating, but it's interesting is prices came down in Washington um, especially and in Colorado and Oregon, which are more mature markets, um, you see a lot less black, black market activity. In places like um, Nevada, where you know, they're still bringing – now they've brought a lot of um, cultivation online, um, but you know, they have very high taxes – and, you know, product can easily come from, you know, people can come from California and Oregon. You see a more active black market, right? Um, and, and, but but as, as the markets mature, the black market does, you know, it, it eventually does, it does definitely decline substantially. And, and how many are, are people would you say, you know, if you were to predict who come from kind of the illegal side of things are looking to actually uh, go the legal route? Um, I would say a whole bunch of them. And I think <laughs> what's really interesting is is Humboldt County because, yeah. you know, Humboldt County is sort of the center of the Emerald Triangle. 
and before um, legalization, you know, from let's call it Grants Pass in southern Oregon down to Napa Valley in California, you know, people have said as much as 90 percent of all cannabis consumed in North America came from that region. And these people, you know, have a venerable history of rebellion and there's the fifth, they call themselves the 51st state of Jefferson, of which, you know, our company, when we founded ourselves, we founded ourselves in the Rogue River Valley. So we actually have that flag in our original plant. And, uh, but what's interesting is when legalization first came, only about 30% of the farms in Humboldt opted to go legal. Now I'm hearing it's, um, it's the numbers increase substantially where the permitting's up to 60%, right? So, so people are starting to come across, even the guys who, you know, have been doing it since the days of hate Ashbury, when, you know, Wavy Gravy, the Grateful Dead's clown, you know, came up to Willits and the whole movement sort of started in the Emerald Triangle. Um, you know, so it's, uh, yeah, I'm definitely seeing a movement towards, you know, coming into the legal space from the, from the most, how do I say it, the most... Um, rebellious parts of uh of of the cannabis uh space in the united states uh kieran have you uh have you have you been, you've been down there then to, to humboldt county oh oh i have to, i go often i go often wow. I actually have a partnership in um ukiah um, which is mendocino it's the seat and then once you go north from ukiah you get to willits and Willits, you know, they say that you can still see Wavy Gravy walking around um, with his, uh, you know, holding his virtual dog um, that doesn't really exist with a, with a collar, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, that's, it all started, you know, with um, when, you know, when, when a bunch of people, you know, and it was really Grateful Dead inspired, thought that, you know, the hate ashbury was just too conservative for them in the 60s. And they moved up um, to the far reaches of California, which even to this day are, you know, hard to access. Um, and uh, they started growing and it became, a, you know, the largest growing belt in North America. I, I've always heard uh, from a few, uh, not always, from the few people I know have been in that area, that it, that it truly is surreal. Like it almost doesn't feel like it, it's sort of a part of North America or something. Like it, it's sort of its own unique, special spot. Is that, is that how you feel about it? Oh, oh, definitely. It's a special spot. And um, Netflix has, has memorialized that in their uh, series that I'm sure a lot of your listeners have watched called Murder Mountain, right? Um, but it's not, you know, I don't ever, I've never had a feeling of not being safe there. <laughs> but when I saw that series and you look at Garberville and you look at some of the, you know, some of the, you know, some of the younger generation who goes up there to trim or for the romance of it, you know, I could definitely see how that exploitation exists and and it's hard for the sheriffs and those guys to really police that area i mean you know last time i was there uh, the national guard was up there and there was a task force and they were going to different farms and trying to you know you know enforce things but again they have to be very careful themselves because they don't want another waco on their hands as well so it's a delicate balance even with the law enforcement up there and how they have to approach things uh, and a lot of that series sort of shows the days of uh, like the the Reagan sort of say no to drug campaigns and and uh, you know the trying to trying to put a stop to this kind of stuff. And you're very experienced. And that was one of the things when we were hanging out at dinner, Kieran, a CEO of uh, Halo Labs, uh, HaloCanada.com. Um, you know, you you've you've kind of been around. Uh, uh, you know, and I'll let you tell the story, but, you know, exploratory uh, uh, kind of, uh, f- uh, what am I, progressive ways most of your life. Is that correct? I would definitely say that. I mean, <laughs> uh, I'd say, uh, you know, I mean, I grew up in Los Angeles and I grew up in a, you know, in a, in a, I was, my parents both came from Punjab. They met at UCLA. I was a first generation, uh, you know, uh, American Punjabi. But uh, my my mother's father, you know, which I discussed at um, dinner with you, um, my grandfather, who's now passed, was a an a original marijuana researcher, and um, he uh, compiled his research. And I could get in. It was interesting. It started during World War II and on the Eastern Front uh, in Calcutta, where he was a doctor, and he used cannabis oil um, to treat people um, for various um, ailments. And he compiled his data. And, I think in the late 60s, I believe he came to the United States and he presented the New York Academy of Sciences on the medical uses of cannabis. And, uh, 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's been it's something that's been, you know, very prevalent to me. And when this whole movement started in 2012, I, you know, it was something that I wanted to be a part of. I feel like that would surprise people to hear that there's actually been so much sort of research and development, you know, years and years ago, decades ago, uh, by pioneers and advocates uh, such as your grandfather, uh, to say like, wait, whoa, wait a second. Obviously, they've proven something here uh, that's better than uh, most, <laughs> which we hear about on the daily. Uh, and, and that, you know, the lack of action. Do you? I mean, do you still give your head a shake to to think about how long this process is taking? Yeah, I, I think you know the the plant has been around, obviously you know, probably longer than man, right? And it's something that has been used, um, you know, for such a long time. But somehow over the last 100, 125 years, you know, it, um, it became a pariah. When it's, when it's always sort of been, you know, sort of part of that whole ecosystem with, say, chamomile, peppermint, you know, what have you. It's a, you know, it's an herb. It's a natural occurring herb, um, you know, it's not a, it's not, you know, it's nothing evil or, you know, but, you know, anything, anything used in excess, you know, can lead to issues, you know, even cannabis. Um, so, you know, it's, you know, everything in moderation is, is, is sort of a good motto there. Yeah. I mean, you, you eat a good bag of salt vinegar chips like every couple hours for your whole life. You're not going to be doing well either, right? <laughs> No, absolutely not. <laughs> uh, Karen, Karen, I just, just, you know, I want to make sure I'm saying your last name correctly. It, it, Karen Sidhu, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. I'm just, I'm just making sure. Uh, Karen Sidhu from from uh, Halo Labs, uh, HaloCanada.com. I would love, dude. Listen, I get to LA from time to time. What I'm going to do? I would love to do a show from Humboldt County. How do we make that happen? Oh, we can definitely make that happen. We should do it at Will. We should actually do it in Willits, where it all started, uh, up in Mendo or up on the border there in Garberville. Oh, that would be definitely now because it's it's you know it's um it's almost harvest season. It is harvest season actually, and so the plants are all in full stretch. I'm actually headed here tomorrow morning um, to Medford, Oregon, to go look at our farms. We have six we have six acres of beautiful outdoor plants. It's been a wonderful growing season, the best I can recall, and I'm really excited. I'm going to get on a plane at 5 a.m., and hopefully I'll be at our farm by 11.30 up in Medford, Oregon. Uh, and, and uh, man, that sounds, it sounds beautiful. It sounds, it sounds sort of, you, you know, euphoric in a way when you, when you talk about it like that. Is there, you know, not to get too, too business minded right now, but when you look at sort of what, you know, Canadian LPs have done and a lot of indoor growth and stuff, uh, ultimately, do you, you know, do you think a lot of these companies might've, might've sort of, you know, shot themselves in the foot, so to speak saying like, Hey, listen, there's going to be bigger, uh, competitors out here who can truly grow the plant the way it was meant to be grown, which is, you know, sort of naturally outside and controlled controlled environments to, is it going to be tough for a lot of these companies in your opinion you know i you know indoor flower always an indoor product always has a place because in an indoor scenario a you can perpetually harvest right where you know us who grow who grow with the sun we have one very very large harvest um indoor plants tend to have a higher concentration of the cannabinoids and you know in particular thc um but yeah you know it's it's much more costly right so it's a cost benefit analysis and uh you know when you have the, when you have the sun and the earth and you don't have all that power and you're indoors you know i personally you know have always grown up in historically in an outdoor environment that's not to say that they've shot themselves in the foot they did what they have to do you can't i mean you can grow outdoors in certain parts of canada like you know that southern part where you guys grow wine in um, bc um you know there's a there's a region there we can grow outside i think you can grow outside in the niagara region but it, you know in canada you have to grow indoors or you have to grow in greenhouses pretty much besides a couple of regions where the where you can actually grow it outside for for sort of a layman when it comes to the growing experience of cannabis how how um you know how big can some plants get Oh, um, these are going to be really, really big. I, I'll, I'll, I'll take a picture and send it to you. <laughs> yeah, do so. I want to retweet it. I'll, 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 I'll definitely show it to you, but it'll definitely be, it'll definitely be a couple of heads over me, and it'll be a couple of times wider than me. You know, some of them. They, they, they can outdoors and in, uh, in especially in, uh, in the you know in the Emerald Triangle, you can get some really big plants. They, they, they start looking like trees. 
And, and what's amazing is they grow that quick from, uh, you know, from you put them in the ground, say, in the middle of May, and by the time you're at the end of September, you know, you got these big trees. Unreal. I didn't. I actually had no idea a the size they could get and how quick that you know that they could get there. Uh, Kieran, I, I love this stuff, man. And and you know, I love the history. I love the advocacy. I love the fact that you you know you've turned your knowledge into a publicly traded company. Uh, Halo being uh, the ticker symbol. Uh, check it out. And you know, again, we you know we talk about stocks and, and and business and all that kind of stuff. And I'm not allowed to give them financial advice, but I can tell you, uh, <laughs> based on your revenues alone, and you can see that it's all disclosed. Uh, it feels like a very very uh, goodbye right now in my very honest opinion do your due diligence people if you're listening but uh, your brain I want to I want to hopefully continue these chats with you and um, I you know learn about the business side learn about what's going on in America because it's a much different sort of outlook over there right now than in you know, obviously what we're seeing here in Canada uh, and just to con- continue to learn from from uh, well, your big brain Kieran if you don't mind me saying oh, hey thanks Todd I appreciate it all right, Kieran uh, Sidhu and uh, Halo Labs, uh, halocana.com, a uh, really interesting, uh, awesome individual. We'll, we'll catch up down the road. All right, take care. Okay, cheers, uh, Kieran. Uh, wow, the the uh, cannabis space is, is you know, ever, ever changing, and ever we're all learning about this stuff. This is the Todd Shapiro Show on Canada Talks, Sirius XM 167.